So to continue our exciting foray into the giant confrontation between 1E cognition and physics, that's the plan today. And we need to talk a little bit about measurement. I said that the inquiry being conducted here is the inquiry of a single body. At least I have a single body. But the relationship of that to worlds, persons, minds, and so on must be considered undetermined at this stage. The thing about the body is it's mesoscopic. That is to say, it provides you with the center from which any notion of small or big arises. Small and big have no objective characteristics. They require a centering of some sort. Now, we saw the very abstract centering on the coordinate plane of Descartes with his zero point at the intersection of the two axes. That gives an abstract centre, but the body gives a very concrete centre. And therefore, it seems natural that measurement should be body scaled. Measurements that's of relevance to an embodied being like me should be body scaled. Now, here we need to contrast physics, classical mainly, and the odd considerations from embodiment. In physics, we have a discipline which emerged over time. It became a specialization within the sciences, as the sciences in the 19th century fragmented and became all kinds of different disciplines. Each discipline then constructed its own domain of discourse using discipline-specific jargon, assumptions, terms. So that there's coherence within the disciplines, but these terms don't necessarily travel easily across disciplines. Now just what counts as a measurement is going to vary hugely from discipline to discipline. There's no gold standard, unfortunately. For example, one of the craziest approaches to measurement is to ask people questions and record their answers and call that a datum, as if one had measured something. Now physicists wouldn't be as silly as that. That's for psychologists. Um, physicists have at their disposal exquisite measurement techniques. Physical variables are those which can be measured to multiple decimal points of precision. Um, and this is largely where physics gets its power from. Now, measurement looks differently depending on what we're engaged in, but we're going to focus in this particular confrontation of embodied cognitive science and physics on space and time. We're not going to go into the measurement of time. That is, as you may be aware, a horrendously complex business. We're going to ask ourselves about space because we want to get back to geometry. Geometry is of great embodied interest as well as mathematical and perhaps physical interest. So, in physics, we measure things with great precision. How is that possible? Lordy, well, because we have good standards, good units. And when it comes to space, the unit that's king is the meter. Meter is the basic unit which has given us command over space. Notice that the measurement of space and time are quite unlike the measurement of, for example, the temperature in the inside of a turkey when it's cooking in the oven. To measure the temperature of the turkey, you need to perturb the system. You need to take something and put it into the system and allow an interaction between the measurement device and um, the turkey in order to get a reading. Most physical measurement is of this sort, it requires interaction, but spatial measurement is different. I see no interaction in the measurement of space. Space-time will emerge as the necessary construct for the business of physics, but in need of severe reconsideration from pers the perspective of the embodied being. Quite remarkable. So I wonder Give us an example here to hone our intuitions about the measurement of space. And the example, again, comes from India. And it has to do with the manner in which an altar is constructed for the fire sacrifice, a venerable Vedic ritual going back many thousands of years, probably way more than 2,000 years, and I believe still conducted today in Karnataka. And for this ritual, 
a, an altar of very specific proportions need to be needs to be built, and there are very strong geometric constraints. There are semicircles and squares that need to be constructed. And Indian techniques are not Greek techniques. There's going to be no compass and straight line involved here. And when it comes to measurement, the abstraction of the meter is not employed. Rather, we have a situation where the end product, the measurement is to serve in the construction of the altar. And so we need a measuring unit suited to the construction of the altar. And the measuring unit chosen is itself a composite of smaller constituents. The smaller constituents in this case are, I believe, sesame seeds. One angula is 34 sesame seeds, which is about seven centimeters. And that's the measurement needed. Now, there is no standard sesame seed buried in a vault in Paris. If you want to employ this measurement, you need to get yourself a whole bunch of, me of sesame seeds in order to construct an angular. That is, the measurement employed here never lifts off from the continuous material substratum. Let that sink in for a minute. There's no abstraction involved. We have... Um, a project to build an altar, that's a specific purpose. We have a substantial reality, which includes, among other things, identifiable sesame seeds. And the measurement is the business of constructing a middle term between the much smaller sesame seed and the much larger altar. So I find this very interesting because when we come to the measurement of the meter, we're dealing with a French abstraction. The meter lives, well, used to live in a vault in Paris. Um, they were established there in the, in the 1900s. And the meter was an imaginative construction. It is, in its own way, the middle term, but this is hidden. It's hidden because we pretend that the meter is entirely abstract. The meter, in fact, is derived from the imagination of the French. Very brilliant imagination. And it's a very useful measure, there's no doubt about that, but it's not quite as abstract as we make out to be. There was, for a long period of time, a standard meter bar stored in a vault in Paris, as there was a standard kilogram, for example. And from this standard, copies need to be made, and copies of copies and copies of copies. Because that's the only way measurement can actually propagate, spatial measurement anyway. If you want to know how long is this, you, take, you compare it to something else. So the meter appears to be a fully abstract unit, but it is not. It is an, an enormous feat of the imagination to come up with the idea of a measurement unit which is approximately mesoscopic. It's about the right size for a human body to treat of space with. Now notice the sesame seed gave rise to the altar through the middle term of the angola, angular. Now, our measurement practices serve us. We have human projects, and the meter is the mesoscopic center of this. We subdivide it to get all the way down to nanometers. We multiply it, and we think we're still talking about space in the same way. And we use the meter to index distances in the cosmos, for example, between galaxies. Now, that is pure abstraction we have lost sight of the fact that the meter is constructed as a middle term suitable for the purposes of an embodied being. The original imaginative abstraction of the meter came from thinking of the world as a sphere. Now there was some awareness that the world was not a perfect sphere, so there was a flattening of 1 344th with the, between the poles that was taken into account, but otherwise it's a spherical imaginative trick. And we do this. We humans in our practices make use of the most enormous imaginative tricks and we often don't notice when we've done them. So we've contrasted the concreteness of measurement where there's a visible middle term in the construction of the fire altar. The meter appears abstract, but is not abstract. So that's going to give us lots to think about, and we're going to be returning to this theme, but I needed to bring up this measurement question at this point.
We carry on the ramblings of the embodied one in the great confrontation with physics um, in subsequent videos, I suppose. Let's see how that goes.